Before we can answer the questions posed in the previous episode, we need to relate a remarkable story told by Brigham Young about the Sword of Laban. President Young related the story during a special conference at Farmington, Utah in June 1877. President Young believed the story of the cave and its contents, including the unsheathed sword, to be of vital importance. He cited other eyewitnesses to these things. Once again, the sword of Laban takes on importance far beyond its reported origin. The sword of an unknown keeper of a treasury, rich and connected though he was, has become the symbol of the future kingdom of God. It has become, in symbolic terms, the sword of Jesus Christ, the future king. The sword represents the might and judgment of an angry God who will end the kingdoms of the world and restore his kingdom. The Lord was insistent that the sword of Laban, along with the gold plates and the other sacred things, were of paramount importance. When he promised the three witnesses a view of the sacred objects, he also commanded them to testify of these things to the world. The three witnesses were not only to testify of the gold plates, they were to testify of the breastplate, the sword of Laban, the Urim and Thummim, and the directors. The regalia were to be part of the message of the restoration. There is a profound reason behind the requirement to testify of the regalia. The restoration, unlike it is normally portrayed, was not simply a restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was also the restoration of the kingdom of God on earth. For the newly re-established kingdom to rightfully claim authority, it must also claim the tokens which establish that authority, the royal regalia. The Lord also made it clear that the regalia were viewed by the ancient prophets according to their faith and in like manner as the three witnesses. The breastplate, sword of Laban, the Urim and Thummim, and the directors had been viewed by the ancient prophets. The prophets who were given a special and personal viewing of the regalia were not limited to the Book of Mormon. Surely, the sword was more than Laban's personal weapon. Fine as its workmanship was, this is not sufficient reason to account for its appropriation by the Lord to be his sword of state for his future kingdom. Nor does it explain the fact that the sword was a sacred relic before the narrative of the Book of Mormon. It is very clear from Brigham's comments and the scriptures themselves that the sword of Laban was not really Laban's sword. That he was wearing it when Nephi encountered him does not necessarily make it his. Nor does the moniker given the sword by the Nephites the sword of Laban, ensure that it was his. Nevertheless, Laban was wearing the sword and therefore had access to it. Apparently, he also had the right to wear it, or at least believed he had the right to do so. Yet, if Laban was wearing what can only be called the sword of state of the Davidic kingdom, for that is what the kingdom of God on earth is, then by what authority did he do so? 
Who was Laban, and what was his authority and standing? 